Awesome. <laughs> All right, y'all. Let's uh, let's do this thing. Um, welcome. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Orion. I'm the the programs and events coordinator for uh, a little nonprofit called the Snake River Fund. Uh, we are thrilled to be hosting Luke Mel tonight. Um, Got to say, I was a little overwhelmed with the response we got. Um, there's a lot of folks who are interested in this talk, and um, I think it's a testament to uh, the impact that Luke is having on the community. And um, it, it's just a, it's a great thing. It looks like we have 23 folks here tonight so far, and the, and the list is growing. So fantastic! Thank you all for being here again. Um, and just like Luke said. Um, we will be recording this, I'm recording it now, and I'll be um, uh, posting it. So if, if you have to duck out for whatever reason, don't feel bad, or if you have a friend who you think might enjoy the content of this talk, but wasn't able to make it for whatever reason, um, just rest assured that um, you'll be getting a copy of this recording. I'll email it out to everybody um, in a couple of days time. So I know you're all here for Luke, but um, I can't help but take a second to introduce the Snake River Fund to everyone. I know a lot of you joining us tonight are kind of from outside of our traditional sphere of influence. So we're a small nonprofit based in Jackson, Wyoming, that um, in the late 90s, we were kind of born out of a community desire to keep the, the Snake River Canyon, which is like our, our daily whitewater stretch um, and is managed by the Bridger Teton National Forest as a free recreational resource um, for the community when there was talk of implementing a, a paid permit system. So. Um, since our inception, we, we've really become a, a stronghold in the community as an organization that promotes responsible public access to and stewardship of um, all of the waters in the upper Snake River watershed. Um, and more recently, we are finding our voice in regional and, and even national um, conservation efforts. So, of course, um, all that work is, is done through strong partnerships and generous donations from the public. So, a really big thank you to all of those who chose to shell out a, a couple bucks for tonight's events, um, really every penny helps. So um, thank you for that. Every little bit um, helps with our educational initiatives, our river safety campaigns, um, and the stewardship work we do. So I will be throwing a link in uh, the chat to our donate page, just in case any of y'all find a, a fiver in the couch and you're looking to protect some rivers. Um, and if you're ever in Jackson, I know, again, a lot of you for, are not from, um, this immediate area. If you're ever in Jackson, look us up. We're a staff of two um, and we're aspiring pack rafters and river enthusiasts who are always looking for an excuse to get on the water. So we love sharing our favorite stretches of river with, with like-minded folks. So look us up. Um, all right, I'm almost done flapping my gums. Um, we are over the moon to be uh, hosting Luke, um, it, it, you know, world-renowned backcountry traveler, pack rafting pioneer, general badass, and author of the soon to be released pack raft handbook, um, for those of you who were not at last night's talk um, with APA, Luke basically gave us an inside look at the, the content and quality of the Packraft Handbook, and frankly, it looks, it looks awesome. So um, Luke seems to have a real unique knack for dovetailing wilderness experiences with what it means to be human in a, in a poetic and relatable way. So if you're an avid Packrafter, um, you're just getting into the sport or you know, even a backcountry enthusiast toying with the idea of spending more time on the water. I think there's a lot to learn from the handbook. Um, and who knows, the information therein might save your life or, or, your, or your partner's life someday. So if you haven't already, head over to Luke's website, thanks to lukeat.com, pre-order that book. Um, I will also throw a link to his website in the chat. And um, really quickly, I'll give a shout out to our sponsors for this event who were generous, gave us some prizes to give away. That'll happen at the end. Um, we have an Umpqua fishing pack, we have uh, a mixed four pack of cider from Teton Valley's newest brewery uh, and only cider brewery, High Point Cider. We got um, a Snake River Fun hat and buff. And finally, um, we will be awarding an IOU to one attendee for a copy of Luke's new book, which is still um, being printed. But once those puppies are hot off the press, we'll, and in our hands, we'll, we'll mail um, one lucky winner a copy of that. So, all right, Luke. I'm done. I think um, we'll let you do your thing. We'll quickly give away prizes, then we'll wrap it up with a with a Q and A. If you guys have any questions as this thing's rolling, we're, we are going to try to keep it somewhat conversational. But um, just throw your questions into the chat. I will field those to Luke, and then after the prize giveaway, we're going to do um, a Q and A where you guys will have the opportunity to unmute yourself and 
ask Luke any questions you might have. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Luke Mel. Awesome. Thanks, Orion. Yeah, I'm psyched. Uh, it was really fun to get an email from Orion uh, on behalf of Snake River Fund. Um, I sometimes feel like I'm in a little, well, a pretty big fishbowl here, actually, up in Alaska. It's a big state, but, but everybody knows each other already. So it's fun to talk to new folks and to see some friends here. And, and actually, my grandma's on here, which is really neat to see. So I'm psyched. Um, Orion originally reached out and was interested in uh, a talk on pack rafting. And I was like, oh, pack rafting, that's so yesterday, um, which is true in this case, that was yesterday. And, and that talk was recorded. So if you come out of this wanting to know more about pack rafting, um, we can get you the link to that. Um, but let me give you a, a real brief introduction to who I am since I don't know most of you. I'm calling in from Anchorage, this has been my home um, since high school, I grew up uh, in a community on the Cuscoquim River. So that's like uh, maybe population 500, you have to fly in, it's off the road system. So it's a pretty unique experience, I guess, compared to most um, Americans, but was normal to me, you know, as a kid, you don't know any better. And I'm really grateful for that upbringing to, to be on a river and to be in a community that was half native and to just kind of watch and learn how people are interacting with the land there. And, and it's a really different interaction than what I do now and what I assume most of you do as well, where it's, it's for sport, for fun, for recreation. Um, the outdoor time that I saw and experienced growing up was like functional. Like you, you didn't really go out unless you were coming home with either wood or fur or uh, food, fish um, or moose, you know. So I think that's, uh, I'm just really grateful that I got to see that and I'm choosing not to do that now. Now I go out for fun um, and that's a, that's a luxury and I recognize it as a luxury. I've been super fortunate. I left the state for 10 years to go to college and grad school and studied geology, same as Orion. We have that in common. And then uh, came home and worked in the environmental sciences um, for the last 10 years and, and started pack rafting really when I came home to Alaska. And, it, and that was, that little boat was life changing, literally for me. Like the Cuscoquim River that I grew up on is, it's big and it's cold and it's silty. It's, it's scary. Like none of us kids knew how to swim there. I didn't learn how to swim until I went to college. And, and the river was an obstacle. It was like an, a barrier to travel. Um, unless you're going up and down the river on a boat, which my parents did, you know, but as a kid, you don't really, you didn't really register that. So then the pack raft uh, and being able to like be in control of myself, of my boat on water was just kind of changed the game for me. And all of a sudden, all of those blue lines on the map became trails and became access points. And so that was a really neat transition for me. And so for the last 15 years, between pack rafting and backcountry skiing and, and these last several years, ice skating has been a big focus of mine, backcountry ice skating. Uh, Derek Collins is calling in from, from near Jackson. He was, we were on a trip together. Um, it's just an excuse to get out and to see Alaska. I, I'm, I'm just in love with the Alaskan landscape and the Alaskan experience. Um, so I think that's all I wanna say about myself. I, I spent the last year and a half writing this pack raft handbook. I, poured myself into it. I quit my job. I put a bunch of resources into it, um, way more than I expected um, initially, but it's been hugely rewarding. I, I left a job that was stable and, and stress-free, um, but, but, but I wasn't creating anything there. And, and the opportunity to, to leave that and, and create this book has been really, really refreshing. I'm sorry to feel really lucky. So um, the journey I'm going to take you on today is it's kind of exploratory. And so maybe I'll make a request that you give your donations now so that halfway through this, you're not like, what the heck, this isn't what I was <laughs> online for. Um, and, and that's part of why Ryan said, like, we're gonna try to make this conversational um, to the extent that we can over the internet, which is awkward. But I'm gonna go ahead and, and start up this keynote. Everything look good and sound good there to you, Orion? Yeah, looks great. Cool. And can you see uh, like a clean slide of the presentation now? 
Yep. Okay. So uh, when I convinced Orion to let me talk about something that was not specifically pack rafting, he gave me free license and I jumped on the opportunity to explore this idea of uh, an attention threshold. And this is new to me. That's why I'm saying this is exploratory. This is, this is not a new concept. Um, and I think people that are probably better read in um, um, natural history and philosophy are probably more familiar with this concept, but it's new to me and I'm excited about it. So that's why I, I put together this presentation. And, and I'll walk you through what, what brought me there um, and where we're trying to go. And the, the realization for me was that um, my wife, Sarah Hassan and I were on a trip just last fall and we had an experience that just suddenly shifted our attention. And it was the first time I really noticed in the middle of the woods where what I was thinking about just radically changed from one mile to the next. I'll walk you through what happened. I don't have a perfect illustration of that, but I wanted to include this. This is from the artist, Sarah Glaser, who illustrated the Packraft Handbook and kind of the same idea. This guy, Tony Prelli is, you know, taking notes here, but he's thinking about his experience on the water. And you could think about this just the opposite direction that that guy there in the boat in the thought bubble could be thinking back to the notes he's taking, or maybe it's his workload or his shopping list or whatever. So the focus of this talk is really like, what are we paying attention to when we're outside? And so I'm gonna start with a little video here of this trip that, that my wife and I were on. Um, and then I'll walk you through some photos to, to just really emphasize the, the transition there in mindset. Um, I don't think you can see my cursor but upper left is a little inside of Alaska. Um, and there's a, all of these blue lines are trips that I've done in the last 15 years, human power trips. And so you can kind of get a sense, like I'm just trying to collect as much of the state as possible. Um, and, and we had a gap, I had this gap in the Eastern Alaska range and, and my wife and I have been trying to get there for years and the weather forecast is usually bad in, in September. And we wanna go there because that's when the colors are changing and there's a bunch of birch in that part of the state. So it's a really pretty area to visit in the fall. And then the main site here, the red route is what we did. And, and so we crossed a couple of glaciers, uh, ended up on a, on a the Tote River and used pack raft, used a pack raft to float out to the road. So we started out on the road, we ended out on the road. I think this was about a hundred miles. And I'm going to play you a, maybe a three or four minute video of the trip. Luke, for some reason, I'm not hearing audio with it. I know you had some music to go along. You say you're not hearing audio? No, is, is anybody else? I know it was working a minute okay, ago. Let's, let me just, thanks for that. And let me just try again. This won't take long. I know what I did wrong. Thanks for speaking up. Yep. So just within the few first few seconds here, let me know if you don't see that audio come through.
I go Feeling sorry for myself when I'm home alone I'm not right inside All my life when I'm down on me Then I'm down on you Thought you'd never ever leave Can you hear me here now as well? Yeah. Yep. Um, so you, you might not have noticed that there's a, there's a single clip in that video that had Jeep tracks. And, and so that's the origin of this whole theme for me. So let me walk you up to it. We drive, you know, four miles or so to, to, to um, park in this gravel pit. And I mentioned that the forecast usually isn't very good in this part of Alaska in September. The forecast was good. And we're in the middle of the night and it starts snowing. And we're just like, what the heck, man? And we wake up and one side of the car is plastered with snow. Um, so we came in with some wind. And so then it's like, oh, should we even do this? But we've been, we've been trying to visit this area for a couple of years. So we do it. And what I am going to emphasize in these slides is the, the walking conditions. So in this one, it's like a thin... Uh, cover of snow that basically hides slippery and loose rocks. Um, and then oh, we get distracted by a grizzly bear, right? That's welcome. Pretty cool to see a, a grizzly run across this plain below us. And here are a couple of caribou up on a ridge. But we're just cranking along here. This is day one, day two. And, uh, and then this is another of the, the footing that we're on. It's all off trail and these are these big hummocks. And again, like takes a little bit of uh, focus to put your footing through this, especially with these, these slippery snow pockets on the lee side. You probably can't see Sarah here. She's in the center of the frame, like this little kind of red dot toward the bottom. Um, we're working our way down this ridge and then gonna walk that, that gravel bar. Um, and we had two, maybe two or three glacier crossings. And, and these are great. We, we get a perch up on a moraine where we can look across the glacier and we just have this, this really nice conversation. It's one of, the, it's one of our best dynamics as um, husband and wife, <laughs> where we can be like, what line do you want to pick through there? And, and, it's, and Sarah says, how about this? And then we go back and forth and we identify some, some markers that we can use to, to um, kind of keep track of where we are in our crossing and, and the markers. We have funny names like Mr. Big Rock or whatever. Um, but, uh, but a lot of focus on navigation and picking our line and watching where our feet go. This is the surface of one of those glaciers and it's got this thin um, kind of crust of moraine and loose rock. And so again, like just a lot of attention required uh, just to be moving forward. So we get out of all of that and we tie into um, a system of mining trails. And this is what was so unique. Like in Alaska, uh, almost everything that we're doing is off trail. And so it was really unusual to spend four days putting all of the mental power into picking a line and, and choosing the right course through, um, through rough terrain to then end up on a road. And so we're on the road and, and we're, we're grateful for it, right? It's easy travel. And uh, we, we both kind of, tilt our heads down. We're like looking at the trail in front of us and we 
pick up the pace. We kind of lean into it and we're just cranking, we're cranking, we're cranking. And, and uh, half a mile into this, I kind of stop and I checked in with Sarah and I'm like, like, whoa, I'm thinking about like my to-do list and my chores I left at home and this, you know, the, what I have left to do on the Packraft handbook and should I quit my job and all this stuff? Like, what are you thinking about? And she's like, yeah, you're right. Like, Sarah um, is a business owner for this um, mental health and physical fitness um, online programs. And it's, it's her, it's all her. She has, it's hard for her to, to take a week off to do a trip like this. And, and one mile previous, it wasn't in her mind at all, right? She's focusing on the terrain, the smell, the vegetation, where to put her feet. Uh, and then as soon as we get this, this road, she's thinking about stuff back home too. So we keep going and then of course, you know, this is Alaska. So the road ends at um, some hunting camps and these guys had, had dragged this moose like multiple miles on the gravel bar. And so we were like followed this drag. It was, that was kind of surreal. Kind of this bloody drag stripe down the gravel bar to then end up on the Toke River. We have a two person pack craft here, 10 pound boat um, that we could float out to the highway. So I, I know that I'm coming from a little bit of a different perspective and experience up here where, where most of what we have is off trail and it's unusual to be on trail. Um, but I think that this, this mindset and sort of presence and what are you thinking about uh, is relevant to everybody. And so that's, that's where we're gonna go for the, the rest of our time here together. And I've tried to lay it out here in a grid to make it relatable for other activities. So this top row is a sort of us in the parking lot. And it's like, yeah, my brain is definitely like, maybe I should go back home and, and finish that chore list. Uh, as opposed to being on a trail where we're still kind of thinking about some stuff in town, but we also noticed that that red stripe, I didn't point that out before, that was this big smear of bear poop from the berries they've been eating in the fall. Um, compared to the image on the right, that is Sarah walking on this really rough footing. And I think I, I talked to uh, one of my friends that's a trail runner and I kind of put this to him and he's like, yeah, same thing. If I'm running on a road, that image on the left, I'm thinking about home, work, kids, school, whatever, um, compared to running on a trail where I asked him what he notices and he says, I notice patterns in the roots. I notice a cool rock here or there. And then maybe you take that one step further on the right, if you're doing some kind of extreme mountain running, the woman in that image is probably just thinking about like the next foot placement, like it demands full attention. Uh, likewise for bikes, road, uh, riding on a road versus riding on a trail, lower right hand corner, like that guy that's midair, like I guarantee that dude's not thinking about like taxes or dinner um, or his kids or his wife, you know, whatever, like that, what he's doing requires full attention and full focus. And that's not sustainable. Like we, I don't think we, we could put ourselves in that position um, for long periods of time. But it's something I'm going to start paying more attention to about like, when am I, when am I centered in my environment? And when am I distracted and thinking about stuff back home? So assuming we want this sort of sense of presence or attention, how do you get there? And, and for me, at this point, I'm, I'm thinking of that in terms of challenge and in terms of creativity. So let's go through these. The challenge part, uh, like in that, that, that grid of pictures I just showed, the conditions that are more challenging require more attention. And that's great, except for that more challenging usually means higher risk, like that guy that's airborne, that woman that's running up that ro rocky slope, um, those are riskier scenarios. And so I've included a couple figures that are coming out of the Packraft handbook here. This one on the lower left, um, some folks are maybe familiar with this, this uh, psychologist, Mihai Csikszent Mihai, and he um, spent his whole career basically studying the mindset of flow, like where you're in the zone. Um, it's really neat studies. And he did it for athletes and musicians and artists and uh, business professionals, you know, across the board, and and just really explored this space where you can 
find flow when you match your skill level with an appropriate challenge. And so this illustration is a little bit modified from, from his model, um, but it kind of gives you a sense that if you are highly skilled in doing something that is not challenging, you might be in a state of apathy. Um, that's the person that's falling asleep in their pack raft. Or if you are uh, a novice and you are doing something very challenging, that's gonna put you in a state, mental state of frustration or anxiety. So the, my concern with this space is that if you feel like you need to keep seeking harder and harder challenges, that means you're seeking harder and harder risks. And so for us in the water world, it's like, okay, I've done class two, now I'm ready for class three. Okay, I've done class three, now I'm ready for class four. The step from class four to class five involves a huge increase in, in risk and danger. The step from class five to class six is like, if you mess up in class six, that's basically fatal. So there's a little bit of a trap here as far as like figuring out how to increase your challenge safely. And part of that is related to your risk tolerance. And so I, this figure on the right, also from the book, um, was Sarah Glaser's effort to kind of capture her risk tolerance over time. And look at that red curve first. So she's got this really steep spike in her early 20s where she's like psyched to pack raft and she's going out and things are sweet. And then it plummets and she's got a note there, friend of kayaking mentor drowns. So that like resets her. She's like, this is, I was really gung ho and I was pushing it. And then I had this, this wake up event that kind of reset the clock. And then she's got another one, you know, she, she gets back into the boat. She is learning. That's what the green curve is. It's kind of showing her learning curve throughout this time as well. She's learning, she's gaining confidence. And then boom, it says flip and lose pack raft. Climb again, drops for a close call. Climb again, drops for a swim. So this, this evolution of our risk tolerance and, and on here she has it curved downward starting kind of in her mid thirties there. That was actually my influence. I was like, you know what? Like, I, you know, if you have a family you're supporting a business you're supporting, it's like just with age, I think it's pretty common that, that we get less comfortable seeking risk. So these things are related to this, this question of basically like, how do we increase challenge? Um, I've got another illustration here from the book. And this one is trying to capture how we can adjust these different um, parameters like hazard and exposure and vulnerability, difficulty, remoteness, gear, partners, all of these things that go into risk. And I talked a bit about this in the slideshow yesterday. And so I might refer folks to that if they're interested or um, if you wanna hear more about um, hazard and exposure and vulnerability at the end of this session. But I think I'll move on for now and we can come back to this. I love this space. I really like thinking about this. So I'd be happy to talk about it afterwards. Luke, is Narmel a, uh, a nickname? I see the, the knuckle tats there in that illustration. Uh, you know, I Honestly, I'm not really sure what she would. I, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> oh, I, get uh, nar I think it's a little play on like normal, n normal, normal. Oh, clever. This is creative artists license. Um, but I was psyched because I don't have tattoos in real life. And, and this is a nice opportunity to have them uh, and not have to worry about them getting all wrinkly as I get older. <laughs> So, so where I'm at in my evolution on this is trying to figure out like, how do I increase the challenge without increasing the risk? Like that sounds so welcome to me. And that is in part based on losing my friend Rob Kerr here on the left. Um, Rob drowned in 2014, just a couple of days after we'd been traveling together. And it, and it just, it, that was my version, you know, how on, on that last plot where, where Sarah's risk tolerance took a couple big plummets. Well, this one was my big plummet. And it was because Rob was a friend and because Rob and I had been cutting a lot of the same corners and doing a lot of the same, making a lot of the same decisions in how we play outside. And, and he didn't do anything wrong here and I didn't do anything right, but I came out of it and he didn't. And that just, well, it pissed me off, honestly, right? It's like, and then it, that sort of made me 
reevaluate my own motivation. Why am I going outside? Why am I taking these chances? Um, what risk is acceptable and what risk isn't? And one thing that came out of that is I, I dropped down from the class four rod of water that I was running and I, I kind of reset. I bought a kayak because I watch kayakers and pack rafts and like an intermediate kayaker looks like a great pack rafter. And generally I was like, what do these guys know that we don't like, I want to figure that out. So I got the kayak and it's like, how do I edge? How do I brace? And I started paddling class three water, class two water. And I have a little note here on the bottom, paddle up a level. That was kind of the mentality that I took um, into these a year or a couple of years after Rob's drowning, which was like forcing myself to paddle perfectly on easier water. So that, that was a way that I discovered how to increase challenge. Like it made it harder for me to, um, to have this perfect line down the river without making it more dangerous for me, if that makes sense. That was a, that was a really valuable breakthrough for me, given where I was at right then after losing a friend. And then this is a little bit of the part where you guys can demand your money back from Orion. Um, thanks to Guthrie for this picture of, of your local river there. Um, I think this is Snake River. Uh, on this river, you can't paddle up a level, right? You, you can't really make this more challenging. I mean, I guess you could like tow something, <laughs> but that's not really the point. And so, uh, but I, but I do believe in this setting, I've experienced it like, yeah, totally present and attentive and tuned into my surroundings. Um, but in this case, it's not a question of challenge. It's not a question of creativity. That's what we're going to go next. So I just put this note in the corner with this question mark, like, is time one of these variables and these factors? Like, if I was on this river on day six, I think I'd be totally tuned in. I think I'd be very present. But if I was on this river on day one, I might be thinking about stuff back home. So I don't know. We can, maybe you guys can help me flush that out toward the end. So let's talk about the creativity part. Um, I had a, a cool insight and I actually give this, this credit to, to Sarah Histan, to my wife, um, because when we were talking about the difference between on trail and off trail, and we were trying to think of a way to make this relevant to people that don't have as many off trail options as we do here in, in Alaska, she was like, well, isn't it just like paddling? Because when you're on a river, you, you choose your line, you choose a trail. And I thought that was a really cool insight and I totally, I buy it, I'm on board. So top illustration here again from the handbook, these guys are scouting, uh, they've got somebody set up for safety down below, somebody decided portage, but, but you get to create your experience down the river. And, and the effort of doing that makes you pay attention to it. It makes, there's like, there's something about ownership, I think, it's kind of, this is kind of what's working for me. It's like, there's something unique about your own line. You're owning it. And because of that, your head is, your mindset is present, centered, attentive. And I think we can take it a step further. Thor left are some friends um, skinning up in Thompson Pass, Alaska. And I assume that there are a bunch of folks here that are um, also skiers. The guy in the front cutting trail, pretty sure that guy's like tuned in. He's paying attention to um, the terrain, like choosing a low angle line. He's, he's kind of probing the snow as he goes for stability. Like he's very present in that environment. Um, the gal there that's in number two, she's probably fairly present. She's like having to re-break some of the same trail and she's like, dang, I wish he would have turned left there. Like that looks a little steep. Um, third person in this track is probably like doing matrix algebra, right? He's like, oh, when I get home, I got to remember to chop up the garlic because he's just got this highway in front of him. I, I don't know if this is true for you all, but, um, but this is feeling true for me right now. Uh, lower right hand corner is a, a picture from an ice skating trip a couple of years ago to the Arctic Circle, my friend Greg Mills. Greg actually was, was Rob Kerr's partner when Rob drowned. And so um, this was a really nice trip for Greg and I to take together and kind of check in about that stuff. Um, 
these these backcountry ice skating trips that I've been really prioritizing the last few winters are wonderful opportunities to create my own line because there's no trail summer or winter um, and you can you can kind of choose where you want to go you feel a lot of ownership you're paying a lot of attention to the surface of the ice underneath me and I'm and I'm appreciating that that presence being present in that space um, and part of the creativity that's working so well for me in Alaska is the trip planning and I'm doing the trip planning like a major dork like super tech dork here my wife teases me about it um, actually a lot of people tease me about it we got a BNB in for Reno next week we're gonna be in Reno next week and, and we were like oh like it doesn't show you where the exact house is right it gives you like an approximate zone we couldn't tell which side of the river it's on so I was like let's get into Google Earth and we like totally hacked the system and figured out, you know, like, okay, the house is on the north side of the river. We don't want that one, whatever. Um, so I, the, the the URL at the bottom of this page is where a lot of these resources live. Um, I've made a, several posts and pages with kind of instructions on how to work with these um, different resources. Upper left satellite imagery, there's a slider there and it's showing Google Earth quality imagery on the left and Esri quality imagery on the right. This isn't always the case that Esri is more crisp. <clears throat> Sometimes Google Earth is, is uh, sharper, but I'll use either of these, you know, I'll, I'll make sure to use whichever one is, is um, higher resolution when I'm planning a trip and, and trying to understand what I might run into. Lower left, <clears throat> Gaia GPS is a, a phone application where you can have that, that satellite imagery on your phone. You can draw lines over it, drop trail points, uh, um, waypoints, and use that when you're out in the field. And again, super powerful tool to where we are using this is to say, uh, where's the narrowest place that we can punch through some really thick vegetation? Or where's the least steep slope that we can cross um, if we're on skis? Upper right-hand corner, Google Earth. This is a grab from the handbook. And within Google Earth, you can you could measure the gradient of a river, and that's what I've done here. I've color coded it from the yellows, which are not very steep, to the reds, which are very steep, and then kind of test it. Is there a correlation between how steep the river is and how big the rapids are, or how technically how dangerous the, or how hard the rapids are? So this is it's just information. All of these things are collecting information. Um, that, uh, that then enable me to create my own trip, uh, go where I wanna go, do what I wanna do, and sort of think outside of what's normal. This little animation on the bottom is showing uh, windy.com. It's a very powerful tool to, to um, look at weather conditions before heading out on a trip. So again, all of these resources are outlined on my website. And I do wanna emphasize that I don't think, I won't go there quite yet. I, I, I'm, I'm sensitive to making this seem like you have to be in Alaska or you have to be in some like crazy wild remote place to make this work. And I, I don't think that's true. I think the creativity part and the planning part can happen in the middle of Manhattan. Like it's, it's partly a mindset and it's, um, it's really just like, trying to think of something that's your own and through that ownership uh, it kind of forces you to focus on it. It, it it leaves your brain with less room to think about those chores and i'll just give a couple slides here of some of the tools that are helping with that um, for me up here and one is this idea of logistics by convenience and so i've done a few trips up here now where we've we've sculpted the trip to match convenient logistics. So what I mean by that is, in this case, we wanted to go climb Denali. That's the peak there in the back left. And if possible, we wanted to do it without flying to the base camp, without paying for that flight. We've got the time, we're strong. We'd rather um, go in from the road under our own power, if we can. So we coordinated with some friends that, that we're going to climb from base camp. And we said, hey, can you bring our pack rafts in and can you bury them at base camp? And they're like, sure, no problem. So then we've got a point, right? We've got a point on the map. Like, our boats are here. So if we get to that point, we can float. 
from then on. And likewise, at the start of the trip, well, there's this gravel road that goes toward the mountain. Let's bike it as far as we can. And let's invite a bunch of friends for the weekend and buy them food and buy them gas and lend them trailers so they can help carry our stuff. And sure, you know, like eight people, 10 people, they're psyched to get out for a weekend and hike and, and bike this road with us. So this was a Denali climb that was really sculpted around um, help from friends and, and using things that were easy to set up. Um, I have an example of this that I did down in, the, in Montana where uh, I went down for my brother's wedding and borrowed a bike from a friend in college and biked it to Bob Marshall Wilderness and chained it to a tree. And then one of the other wedding guests that was driving through later picked up that bike and drove it back to Missoula. But then I went through Bob Marshall on a pack raft and then like so-and-so, you know, like this idea of just like for folks in Jackson, it's like, well, who's driving to Bozeman? Hey, could you pick up this bike or could you drop off this boat? Like using those to kind of create the objective uh, rather than trying to match logistics to a, a, a predetermined objective, if that makes sense. Um, another concept that's been helpful in this up here is this idea of independent nations. And uh, basically all this means is that we, if we're a group of four, we will pack as two groups of two so that we've got these two independent nations. Um, and part of this is done for safety because if somebody got a big injury, you'd have somebody that could stay with that injured person and then two people that could leave. So that way you're never leaving just one person on their own. But it also gives us the, the option of splitting off when two groups or, you know, two people are interested in something more ambitious or two people are interested in like, boy, I'd really like to hang out and fish tomorrow, like rather than hike that mountain. So, so the independent nations concept is like, yeah, we're doing this thing together, but we're, we're already set up to split if, if we, um, if it, if it ends up being something we want to do. I like the freedom that that gives us. And then again, just to kind of emphasize that this doesn't need to be some early like Greenland crossing or whatever, like the creativity part can be a dog suit there in the upper left, um, a tutu, that's what Sarah's been ice skating in, in all winter. This guy in the lower left, Wally GPX, I can't remember where he's at, maybe, maybe um, Philadelphia. And he's a, I think he's a high school math teacher and he has hundreds of these maps that he's, or, or drawings that he's made by biking through um, whichever of those cities he's in out east. Super cool, super creative. And I'm pretty sure his mindset when he's doing that, even though he's on a bike, on a paved road, he's really focused on this thing he's creating. That's really, I'm inspired by that one. Uh, lower right, just like finding a way to bring, uh, to celebrate a birthday with a, I forget what that stuff, a lay, is that what it's called, around his neck? Um, just some simple things that, that kind of give you some ownership over this experience. Like other people haven't brought the happy birthday banner up to this uh, glacier, you know, or whatever. So um, this is the last slide. I, I have a kind of a highlight video to show afterwards, but I just want to kind of summarize where I'm at with this. And then hopefully there are some questions coming in and you all can help me think through some of these ideas. Um, this, this attention threshold and, and what I'm seeking is finding presence, finding attention in the outdoors. And the keys to me at this point seem to be challenge and creativity. And so in terms of challenge, what I'm really trying to figure out is how to make things more challenging without making it more dangerous. Like how can I force attention into my surroundings without actually having to do something that puts me at more risk? And I think there are ways to do that. And then creativity, using friends, using those convenient logistics. For me, honestly, using being cheap, being frugal, um, and finding ways to, to kind of do some extra work and, and uh, maybe cover a little more ground 
just in order to, to not pay for that flight or not pay for um, that pickup. And, and that then gives me something that's unique, some, some ownership, and I really value about that. And then that little comment there on the bottom, this time thing, that's still my, like, that's a missing piece in this puzzle. That's the part where you can demand your money back. I haven't figured it all out. Um, let me just close with this highlight video from a couple of years ago. It's got some of these ice skating clips and, and just sort of what these, these safe but um, challenging and, and creative um, endeavors are looking like for me. And then let's, uh, let's, let's chat.
Okay. All right, man. That was awesome. That's some inspiring, uh, inspiring adventures you're going on in the backcountry. I never really thought of uh, remote ice skating as something that I would ever pursue, but you make it look pretty sweet, dude. I'm seeing people doing it down there. I think people have been doing it for decades in Colorado, and it is awesome. Yeah, um, no doubt. Yeah, really um, Fraser Black um, kind of was echoing some of my thoughts in the in the chat, talking about time and how in the river community, river time can be a, be a factor when when you're talking about being present in the in the moment, right? Like. He's talking about like the Grand Canyon, you know, and like for me on a river trip, I like, and you, you, you talked about this in your, in your presentation, but like day one, you can find yourself um, falling into traps of thinking about the outside world and stuff, but then day five, six, 15 rolls around and, and you can't remember the last time you thought about um, um, emails or, or, or whatever it is that bugs you in the, in your day-to-day -day life. So. Yeah, yeah, I can relate, and I, and it doesn't quite fit into this sort of simple challenge creativity space uh, that, that we explored here together. But, yeah, yeah. Um, this this trip with Sarah, where it was like day four, where we hit that trail, and it's just like, whoa, what the heck is going on? Like, nothing changed except for our footing, uh, and it was such a radical contrast. Yeah. And I, I was reflecting a little bit on what it, like my ability to be present. Um, and, and a lot of times it, it becomes like it in my recreating, it, it's a function of familiarity a lot of times where if I'm um, going up, you know, the boot pack I've done a thousand times, um, I won't be as like in the moment. And a lot of times, honestly, that it's, I don't see that as necessarily a bad thing for me just because um, it allows me to think clearly about other issues I might be having in life or whatever and, and address those in a, in a wide open outdoor setting. But um, whenever I'm attacking something new, a new river, uh, a new hike, whatever it might be, I find myself being a lot more present. Um, and a question for you, Luke, I, are a lot of your missions, um, do you find that they're are you doing a lot of like setting shuttles or, you know, I was looking at that map that you showed us right at the beginning and it's, you know, looks like you've covered a lot of ground, but are you doing out and backs? Cause going back to familiarity, if I'm doing an out and back, my time returning back to my car is not spent as present, if that makes sense. So what do you find helps you in terms of planning a trip be, be present like that? Yeah. I mean, exactly with what you're saying if, if i can do a loop or a start and end point a one-way trip i uh, much prefer that so i i don't do many out and backs um mm -hmm. and when i do i'm always like darn it i already saw this which is kind of silly because it's it's all awesome right and we're outside and this is all a luxury in the first place um but yep i'm i'm trying to go from point a to point b and as far as how to connect those dots on that map, especially on a scale um, of Alaska, the, the convenience of the logistics in that application is trying to start and end at a village or um, at a road. So, mm -hmm. so um, last summer with COVID, we decided not to fly and we were still able to go into the Arctic refuge, but it took three weeks. We, took, we went like, way far east and then cut way far west and that was just a way to connect those uh, to see as much of the refuge but start and end on the road um, so that's the mentality i'll bring in i'll bring into that i i'd love to hear from folks i think our group our group is not too big um i if, if people want to go got, off mic and jonathan jonathan yeah. uh Strahl. i don't know if i'm pronouncing your last name right but you got a hand up feel free to uh, unmute yourself um share your thoughts. Cool. Thanks, Orion. Yeah. And thanks, Luke. Um, John Straw here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good deal. Yeah. Thanks for the talk, Luke. And yeah, a lot of great uh, concepts that got me thinking there. Uh, one question I had in particular that surfaced when you were talking about the independent nations 
and also just thinking about how you plan a lot of the routes and that's one of your creative outlets. I think naturally you kind of become the leader of the trip if you've planned the route, at least that's generally my experience. And what happens to me sometimes as the group leader, um, I mean, if I'm going out with just with Katie, my partner, it tends to be okay. But if there's like, if there are other people on the trip, I spend a lot of time thinking about whether or not they're having fun. <laughs> I don't know if you can relate to that experience and also trying to kind of tailor the objectives and the, the find the flow state based on everyone's skill level, et cetera. And I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on that topic as a group leader often and how you kind of talk to groups in particular, if you do have different expectations and someone wants to go fishing one day and the other person wants to climb a, a peak, like how, how do you talk through those topics? Yeah, yeah, good question and kind of a complicated one that has changed in time for me. Um, I would say that 10 years ago when I was doing these kind of the most ambitious trips, uh, we were all on the same page, like really similar objectives. And we were also all really involved in the trip planning and the, and the route. Um, we make a, somebody makes a Google Earth file and it makes the rounds and people upgrade um, add things, remove things, add comments. And that all happens kind of in the months leading up to a, a long trip. Um, and so we really didn't have that many issues on those trips as far as objectives and being on the same page and sort of leadership, very level playing field. And I feel pretty fortunate to have had trip partners um, where we just worked together really well on most of our trips. That feels like it's changing now as mostly just as life gets busier. And so now if there's a group of four and two people are really busy with work and one person's busy with their kid and, and maybe I'm the one left that's, that's drawing the lines. And so then I do feel responsibility, especially if something goes wrong. We play a kind of a fun game uh, that maybe some of you will want to adopt where it's like president of the day or of the moment. And it's like, if there's a decision to be made you kind of try to aid each other on until somebody makes a decision and, and we're all pretty passive, uh, my trip partners and I. So like, as soon as there's like an inkling of a preference, like over that pass instead of that one, it's like, we do it. But part of the deal is, is that then we can blame them for anything that goes wrong, but it, but it comes with humor. It's like, Oh man, you're the worst president ever. You know, like, <laughs> Oh, look where you led us or whatever. So it's like, nobody really wants to, Generally, nobody really wants to take the initiative to make a, a call for the group. And, and I think that's in large part why so many of these trips have worked out. Um, uh, I, feel like, I feel like there was more to, oh, I just also wanted to say like specifically with me and, and Sarah, my wife, with her coming off, off of these, um, her workload as, a, as this business owner, I am generally the one drawing the, the dreaming up the plan and part of that's because I want to I enjoy the process but it definitely puts us in some positions where it's like we'll talk about it beforehand like how how willing are you to have this 10 miles be really rough travel and and we'll just try to talk it out that way and and we get better at that the more trips we do because it's like collecting data like I can look at google earth and I can kind of think that looks terrible that looks pretty good and I can then present that to, to Sarah and my other partners and say this part's probably gonna be really hard, but this part looks really promising. So not a clean answer for you, John. Uh, and, it, and it seems to be a moving target. Uh, I guess I'd place the most importance there on, on finding those, those dream partners. And for me, the dream partners have been um, comfortable going to plan B and uh, comfortable talking about risk. And also they just happen to be super strong and super humble about it. <laughs> Derek on this call, man, we had this awesome ice skating trip and, and Derek just was a monster on skis and things went, we had some tough conditions and it's just kind of like plot along and, and one of my favorite trips, like just that mindset really made it um, more than what we accomplished. Is, does this, does the, the attention mindset can can somebody else pipe up and and 
and let me know if this feels relevant um, to you or something you can relate to either as a biker, a runner, a paddler, climber, or whatever. We got Tom Bunter saying, my favorite trip partners are the ones who aren't afraid to turn back. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Yeah, that is nice. Yeah, feel free to raise your hands, folks, or unmute yourself, chime in. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, uh, just, yeah, on that, um, you know, uh, I think I'm in a group of people that know a lot about, like, those, those, uh, the, the human risk factor, right? So those things that kind of affect our decision making. Uh, you know, we kind of want to fit into a group. We might not feel good voicing our opinion, that sort of thing. So some of my favorite partners uh, to go in the backcountry are the people that have said like, hey, you know what? Yeah, I'm, I'm that guy. Like, I'm scared. This is, this is like, I'm just going to say like, I feel uncomfortable. I feel like this is a bad idea. And, um, and so there's, I don't know, it's, I think it's important because, um, uh, you know, you can, you can make a lot of mistakes. Um, so it's, it's good to be kind of self-aware and uh, be willing to kind of risk that vulnerability, like in a social space, um, just to kind of say maybe what you think would be an unpopular opinion. Uh, yeah. Yeah. One of my mentors has said that uh, eloquently. He says, basically, that's, let's celebrate communication. And I really mm. like that. It's like, let's celebrate the, the, the comfort in um, mentioning when something doesn't seem right. So important. Um, quickly, I can uh, do the, uh, the prize giveaway while y'all meditate on um, attention span in the, in the back country. Um, I did a little, uh, a uh, random number generator to do this. So um, we got a hat and buff from Snake River Fun. And if you're not from the community, I'll, I'll just email you um, and, and get your mailing address and stuff and work it out. But hat and buff going to Alex Frank. Thanks for showing up, Alex. We got Umpqua Fishing Pack going to Luis Carlos. I'm gonna mispronounce your last name, Luis uh, Pinzon. Um, Umpqua Fishing Pack, I'll get in touch with you. Hopefully you enjoy that. Um, High Point uh, Cider from a local brewery here is going to our very own Rosalind Moynihan. Thanks for being here, Roz. I don't know how we're going to get that to you. I know you're back east, but um, we'll make it happen. And then the book is going to uh, Jennifer Sparks. Congratulations. I'll get in touch with you and let you know how, um, how we can get that to you eventually. So let's see here. Um, in the chats, we got Rosalind saying, I really like thinking about mindfully bringing the creative aspect into a challenge in a new place to really take the mind away from the ho-hum and the adventure at hand. So I think she's just, she's just um, singing your praises about talking about how, how, how challenges can help you uh, be present. And um, I think that everybody can relate to that. Um, John, again, the creativity of whitewater, creating my own obstacle courses out of rapids, even if they are very familiar. Yeah, totally. I can, I can. I can yeah, totally. With that. I feel like water is really this. Yeah. Water just allows us to, I mean, maybe we're kind of forced to create. Um, uh, and that, that, that really is a new discovery for me. I hadn't really thought about creativity in this, in the set sense of running water. And, and honestly, part of that might be because, my boating background as, um, a, you know, I was like, pack rafting was my introduction to water. And so when I first was running rivers, I'm running them like hiking trails. Like I put my head down and I go and like down the river. And it's only in the kind of second half of my boating career where I was like, oh, wait a minute. Again, kind of um, catalyzed by Rob's drowning. Like mm. I should be catching that eddy. I should be playing on that wave. You know, I should really be appreciating water for the sake of water looks like there's a couple uh raised doug i think now. you had your hand up first um feel free to unmute yourself oh cool um yeah luke i just uh i was really inspired 
inspired by how uh, um, creative some of your adventures have been. And I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about um, where that spark comes from, like when you come up with a new adventure, um, what types of places you get the inspiration from, and maybe the process of putting it into an actual adventure. Yeah, I, you know, the first thing that came to mind is I, I had this little like uh, image pop up in my head of like a cup that has a certain amount of creativity. And I, uh, I was thinking of my job for the last 10 years didn't require any creativity and, and that's why I ended up leaving it. But so that meant I had like a whole cup full of creativity that needed to go somewhere and I'm not playing guitar, I'm not painting. So the place that I put it was into trip planning. Um, and I think other people, like I know my friend Eric that's on here, like he puts a lot of his creative energy into creating experiences for his kids. Like he gets his kids out, uh, out in the woods all the time. It's really cool, but that's like, that's probably taking part of his, his finite amount of creativity that's available. And then for me specifically in Alaska, uh, I'm, I'm just a very visual person and I want to see as much of the state as possible. And, and now that I've got that map with those lines of what I have seen, I'm mostly trying to look for gaps. And then it's kind of like what I said before, like trying to match um, the objective to what's convenient. Uh, I'll, look in a, I'll look in a zone and be like, how can I see some of that? And, oh, there is a village. Okay, so that's, that's part of how I can see some of that. And where can I go from there? And, and I want to cover ground. I want to be as efficient as possible. And so that means if it's in the winter, I want to be on skis. Or if it's in the summer, I want to be floating to try to save the, save the, um, the wear and tear on my knees. Um, but the, the motivation really is coming from wanting to see Alaska and having a job that, that left me room to create. Very cool. Rick, you have a question, thought? Yeah, I guess uh, the thing that's coming to mind, like uh, I've heard the phrase like intention, attention, action. And so like clearly you have the intention to go out with safety which leads to where your attention is focused on safety and leads to your action. Mm. So I guess like if I went out with the intention of creating, you know, some focus on the space or like, you know, being present in that area that may push my attention into actually being present there. Um, but that's just something that comes to mind as you speak is like, I almost wonder if you can pull your research back or, into the what is the intention uh and, and almost back it up a little bit um because once the attention starts to wander i think you know we're sort of lost and it's like I, i'm here to be present or i'm here to be whatever this is i don't know that just kind of comes to mind but i really appreciate everything you're doing it's amazing stuff i i like yeah i appreciate that feedback too i like that and i like kind of breaking down attention going back one step yeah, it's kind of like the, the pre-thought of, of intention. And, and honestly, for me, like where I'm going to go next with this after just spending a couple of days thinking about this um, for this presentation is I'm just going to start paying more attention to what I'm paying attention. There's got to be a better way to say this. You know what I mean? Like next time I'm out for a bike ride, I'm just going to note what am I thinking about here? Trail gets rougher. What am I thinking about here? Same thing when I'm on the water. Same thing when I'm on... Well, it's too late for skis at this point, but it, you know what I mean? Like, that's where I'm going to go now and just kind of collect data. Like, I'm, I'm so data driven. I'm just going to start to, like, pay a little more attention to that and, and try to understand some patterns. And I think that'll let me get to what you're talking about, which is where, like, is my intention to have this very centered experience on the river or on the trail, or is my intention to chill out and read a book and, and maybe brainstorm a bunch of stuff that I'm going to do when I get back home, you know, like write that song, paint that picture or plan that trip for my kids, whatever. Yeah. That's sick. Thank you. I, I don't have any time constraints, so I'm, I'm happy to, to field any other questions or hear from other people. 
Look, I wonder as far as like I've seen it in you, but other people on the classic as well. Um, like there's a certain playfulness that the colors, a lot of the trips I've seen up there that changes maybe the attention, but certainly the feel of the trips. And... Yeah, well, you might be in a better position to, I mean, since you've lived up here and, and done those trips and then compared to, I mean, in Jackson, you have a lot of access to wild places still. Does it feel less playful somehow? Well, I was thinking more like wearing clown pants in the Arctic, <laughs> stuff like that, or making a snowman when your friend's exhausted, or <laughs> it's, like it totally pulls you back into that trip. And I've seen it a lot of people up there that I've tried to put that in with my kids as well, but it kind of focuses and keeps the trip maybe where it should be. I like it. I sure like the playful components of our adventures, but uh, but uh, this is another factor I don't fully understand. I don't. I don't. I don't know why we've been doing that, um, but I like that we have. <laughs> it reminds me a little bit of something Sarah has mentioned, where um, I guess maybe two years ago we were in the Brooks Range, and and her mindset, she was just in this like crappy place, like pissed off about you know what was going on whatever and stuck and then we saw a, a bear we actually thought it was a couple of clumps of dirt you know how they dig up um, piles of dirt when they're rooting um, looking for grubs or whatever and then we got closer and we realized oh this is a bear and um, I'm going to give you just a little detail here because this is a pretty awesome animal experience for us we get closer to the bear and the bear is, is just lying on its back in the sun on this slope uh, so it's just like beach bathing, um, fully belly up, arms out, legs out. And we get close and we realize it's a bear. We're like, hey, bear. And the bear from lying down, it just lifts its head and, and kind of looks left and looks right. And, you know, bears have terrible eyesight. So it doesn't see us. And it's just like, ah, oh, it was probably nothing. Just boom, drops its head straight back down. It was the coolest thing. And then we got closer and made more noise. And then it got up and you know, 20 miles an hour out of there. But that experience snapped Sarah into um, attention and being centered, not just in that moment, but for like the rest of the day. So there was something, I don't, kind of the, the playful thing is what, what reminded me of that, um, that animal interaction, but there was, there was a trigger, a catalyst from that natural environment that just Recentered her, and it was so cool uh, for her. She shared that it was a really cool experience for her. Looks like Micah's got something. Hey, and uh, thanks so much, Luke, for this chat. It's nice to end the day. Well, I'm in Alaska, so end the day like this and uh, reflect a little bit. And I was just thinking about just sort of feedback on your. Um, the concepts that you're throwing out. And I feel like a key to something that sticks and um, really resonates is maybe like trying to figure out how to make it really generalizable for people like across the board. I mean, I feel like we're, we're like the outdoor crew, presumably the people that like we're the choir. So like, how do you kind of reach um, other folks? And I, I really like the, what you're saying of connecting outdoor adventuring either like the planning of it or the doing of it as an outlet for creativity and it seems like um that might really speak to a lot of people who say like oh I'm not an artist I'm not a musician I'm like I'm not a creative person but like that's a that's actually and I loved I like the example of Derek doing stuff with his kids and like that like that's that's creativity and like one way maybe to help individuals connect with the idea is to gather sort of case studies like that where you have like different examples of people being creative in outdoor spaces that like across life stages and across like you know do you live in, you live in San Francisco how can you be out creative outdoors you know versus someone that lives in Alaska um may, might be like and would be super seems really fun <laughs> I mean to like hear people's stories obviously um and then Oh, and then the other one other thought was that um, I'm also a data person 
And I hear, I'm like, Ooh, I want to do that too. Where you're saying like, I want to just, when I'm outdoors, be a little bit more reflective about connecting my surroundings and what's happening with where my thoughts are. And so in addition to creating, to collecting that data from yourself, like if there would be any way to collect that information from other people to sort of like Uh, crowdsource the data set, (laughs) basically, um, I think that'd be so cool. (laughs) I have no idea how to do that, but that's your challenge for the the afternoon. (laughs) I just appreciate that you've You've outdorked me on this, which is which can be hard to do. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with everything you're saying, and um, and I'll just throw out a couple of names there. When I think of this concept, there are two guys that I kind of meant to like read about, and one is uh, Brendan Leonard, who has a blog and has a book, and I, I think this is kind of the stuff he explores. And then another one is I think it's Alastair Humphreys, a guy in the UK. And he does micro adventures. So his is very much this, and he does a bunch of stuff, but this is part of his headspace. Um, So those are two guys that I'm intending to read as soon as I find more time in my life. I just have to plug in my computer, but I'm I'm listening for either Dave or John. John, I think you had your hand up first, if you want to share. Cool, thanks. Yeah, I'll go again. So one of my pieces of self-talk uh, in on wilderness trips, if I'm taking photos or video or any kind of media, is I'll put my camera down and say, oh, I just want to be in the moment. I just want to be here instead of focused on documenting this. And at the same time, I mean, I know you make, obviously you showed a couple of your great videos today and you made you make really solid media. So I think my question is two parts. One is like, do you have that kind of self-talk or how do you sort of balance that need? And then um, since you left your job, you know, part of kind of being in this industry or being an ambassador is showing media. And so how do you think about that? Like when you're on your trips now um, in, in that it may now be a little more tied to like your livelihood or, or your work balance, has that kind of encroached at all or, or has that disrupted your attention when out in the wilderness? Yeah, good, good questions. Um, I have, I definitely have struggled with like that sense, like, oh, I should be documenting this. And then it's like, oh, like what just happened for the last mile? You know, like I spent, I was too focused on, on pictures or I'm even more aware of it for Sarah because she is collecting imagery, you know, for her marketing. Um, on these trips and it's kind of like oh maybe we should do a trip without a camera but then I really love sharing what we see and so I'm going to give you another non-answer on this where it's just this like tug of war and I and I haven't figured it out I guess one thing I'll say is that I've been I've never been in a position where I needed to produce that media like everything has been you know I've I've got a good job Um, I'm healthy whatever like I don't need to produce photos or, 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 or um, a story even, like nobody's expecting that from me. So that gives me a lot of freedom to take pictures or not. Um, and as far as moving forward, I don't know what that's gonna be like. Uh, at, at this point, most of my income is gonna come from instruction. And so that doesn't feel like I need to, yeah, I don't know. I wanna I wanted do things as genuinely as possible and, and this is a good reminder that some of that might change if if my um, livelihood is is going to be based more on my outdoor time. Huh. I haven't thought about that yet. Uh oh. <laughs> How about Dave? Or- well, Luke. Oh, Luke, this is Dave Shumway. Uh, I just first of all, I want to thank you for what you give to the community and and what you're willing to share with folks. Um, I was, I, as you were talking, I was thinking back to a process that I've kind of gone through in my adventuring years. And that's, that's this idea of mindfulness tied to a beginner's mind and to be thinking about trying something new or beginning something new or going somewhere new. And I've made it a point, you know, hop on skate skis and feel like a fool for a season as you're figuring out skate skiing and playing with something that's very foreign to someone that's used to alpine touring. 
um, or traveling to a new country and, and the, the creativity of planning a trip to a new place like that and new language challenge and all of those things forcing you to be present there. Um, of course, then there's the temptation to go back again and then that doesn't have that, that beginners or that new feeling to it. But um, I'd encourage you to kind of think on that as you're thinking through these other things that lead to being present. Man, you're, you're dead on. That fits in really well. And I hadn't put that together. But like, absolutely, when you are on the steep part of a learning curve, right, it's steep because you're challenged. Um, and you get a lot of feedback about uh, rapid improvement. And, and I've had this conversation recently with people about when I'm injured, that's a really good time for me to get on a learning curve. And, um, you know, if it's lower body injury, maybe I do some upper body learning, or maybe it's just completely different, like, like, um, music or, or art or whatever. But like, um, yeah, what you said really definitely works for me. It's like, I love being on that steep part of learning curve, learning how to skate, ski, learning how to ice skate, whatever it is. And part of why I like that is probably that I, I'm paying more attention to what I'm doing. You know, I'm really paying attention to that inner edge or to where my knee is over the ski. Um, and it is forcing me to kind of be present uh, in that activity. So I appreciate that. That fits right in. Also, in general, the, the more you participate in the planning of the trip, like with kids, if you want to trick them into walking a long distance, make them plan the trip with you. And it totally uh, is it? Is that right? Uh, so that's that's the ownership part, right? There's something. Otherwise, there, they're not like into it. They're not focused. But if they're planning, like looking for a certain animal, or or like there's a pass. And that they, they, yeah, they own the trip. Yeah, like what you're saying. That's cool. Yeah, I don't have that perspective with sharing it with kids, but that, that's really cool. That's awesome. Well, it um, turns out. Go ahead, yeah. Luke. I was just going to say, it turns out I lied. I, don't, I can't stay here forever because my wife has a presentation at six. <laughs> so we better wrap up. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. This was really fun. I think having this kind of roundtable discussion was was unique, and it almost felt like I was actually talking to people. It was, it was cool. Um, it did. It was so nice. Thank you all for, for joining. Thank you, Luke, so much for uh, making this happen, and um, I appreciate you all. Feel free to, uh, again, look us up if you're ever in Jackson, and go forth and be good stewards. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. That was awesome. <laughs>